Well, hello and welcome back to the Master Books podcast. I'm so happy to be with you in 2024. We have a great guest on our show. He's been here before, Coach John Stamper. Coach Stamper does the physical education courses in our Master Books Academy. He also um, has written the book, Conflicted, Pulling Back the Curtain on Public Education. His experience in being a Chicago public school teacher and also having been homeschooled as a child and what he is be, was being taught to teach the children and asked to participate in and agree to gave him such confliction in his heart about his own Christian values. Today, specifically, we're talking about chapter 10, Parents Matter. Parents Matter is an amazing chapter with so many quotes, I couldn't stop pulling them out. So we'll talk about a few of those today. I'll be giving away a digital copy of this book to someone in the Master Books app and someone in the Moms of Master Books Facebook group. So stay with us. We're about to get started. Here at Master Books, we are dedicated to help you disciple your children and develop a strong faith as a family. With Pro Bible Homeschool curriculum and beautiful books that honor God as Creator. We offer online courses to help your family worship and serve God. You will also find morning baskets and devotionals for the whole family. Our mission is ink on paper to touch eternity, and we have been publishing Christian books for this purpose since 1975. Find your Pro Bible Homeschool curriculum at masterbooks.com. Well, hi, John. Welcome back to the show. Hello. Thank you for having me. Hi, everybody. We all know and love Coach Stamper from Master Books Academy. He's been on the podcast several times. He has been a participant in our summits that we have done. He's got some great videos on our YouTube channel. We hope that you'll check those out where he's talked about um, run. Don't walk away from public school, but run. And he's got the experience to share with you about that. So, John, tell us a little bit about your book, why you wrote it and how it helps our listener, the homeschool family. Right. So my book, the title Conflicted, really came from my conversation with Randy Pratt. Uh, while I was still with Chicago Public Schools, kind of on my way out, I, I talked with Randy. I met him and told him my story and how I wanted to um, kind of bring my courses over to Masterbooks. And he could sense the conflict that I had within me. Here I was a teacher. Uh, I wanted to be a teacher my whole life. I, As a Christian, I wanted to be you know, a light in the darkness, a Christian yeah. example to my students, my colleagues. So I felt that was where I was supposed to be. But my employer at the time was instructing me to violate my beliefs, to violate mm -hmm. what the word of God mm -hmm. tells me to do. So that was the conflict. And I didn't know how to proceed. Um, yeah. So it really took months of prayer and seeking God's direction. And ultimately, I felt that um, after I you know, contacted the school board with my concerns, I felt it was time to walk away and leave. Kind of how Lot, uh, you know, left the city yes. before destruction was really what I felt mm -hmm. in my spirit. So that was the, you know, the motivation for the book. So what I really wanted to do is just provide information based on my own experience, as you mentioned, as a homeschooler, a public school teacher, I even taught in private schools. I just wanted to share my experience well, from my perspective and just share information for parents who, you know, are trying to make decisions for their own children and other teachers. Mm -hmm. who, if they haven't yet been in that situation, they soon will be just to help them make decisions on their career. Absolutely. Well, one of the quotes in this chapter, chapter 10, Parents Matter, I loved it and pulled it out so we could talk about it today. You say homeschooling is a way that God can be brought back into the home, back into education and back into the hearts and minds of children. And I mean, so biblical. We we do this so much at Master Books and especially on the podcast. Talk about the need to disciple your children at home, so that when they are in the world and exposed to the world's beliefs, they have this firm foundation. So, I'd like for you to talk a little bit more about how you've already seen this book help homeschool families or families that homeschool families love and know and want to influence. Right. Well, so you said, you know, it's biblical. It's true. But also that comes from my personal experience. It's true. Mm -hmm. And that goes to point that we're done here. I, I'm in my own life. So if you've heard me talk before, tell about my story uh, and why my parents decided to homeschool my siblings and me, it was because 
the Indiana Supreme Court ruled in the early 90s in my hometown, the Indiana Supreme Court ruled that the Gideons could no longer distribute Bibles to students, which had been a tradition in that school district. So that decision, the removal of the Bibles, is what prompted my parents to give us a Christian education. And that's something that stuck with me my whole life. So I was five years old being taught, you know, the principles of the Bible from my parents. Right. And then fast forward 30 years, I'm a 35 year old man teaching in Chicago. That story, what my parents did, their decision to homeschool, their prioritizing the word of God came all flooding back to me. And I found myself really in a very similar situation where I had to prioritize the word of yeah. God. And, you know, so that goes to, you know, to tell parents that what you do matters. This is why we're talking about parents matter. Uh, because that stuck with me. And that's not to brag on myself or even to brag on my parents, but to say that God's word is true. What yeah. it says it will do, it does. So and that should be an encouragement to us. You know, the situation, if we look at public schools, can be doom and gloom. But the good news is that the Bible's true and God is faithful. So, you know, that should be the encouraging message, message I hope, that people take away. Absolutely. Well, I'm I'm so thankful. Someone texted me this week and, and used the word, the incorruptible word of God. And I just have been hanging on to that because there is so much corruption. And I, I also feel like it's similar to when um, they wanted to kill the firstborn. You know, they're trying to get rid of Jesus. And the, it, yeah. we're seeing that played out in our culture now. They'll just wipe it all out just to make sure Jesus is nowhere to be found. And I'm so thankful for the homeschool families that we work with at Master Books who have decided that the word is incorruptible, that that is their priority, that they are homeschooling their children in the fear and ad admonition of the Lord. So we do want to honor you, honor your choice. We honor you, John, for taking this stand and going so public with it with your book. And I do recommend, if you haven't read this book, if you haven't shared it with others, the details in here are unbelievable, truly unbelievable for the way we grew up. But it, because today we're seeing so much um, antichrist, right, in our anti-Christian, anti-Christ thoughts, um, principles, laws put into practice. So talk to us a little bit more about Christian parents modeling the gospel in the home and how important that is. I wanted to share a couple of quotes yeah. and then have you um, expound on them. So the one of them is um, there is an intentional, systematic and devastating war that is being waged on parents and traditional family values in this country. So true. Sure. So I kind of look at it from two perspectives. One, as a teacher, I was a teacher for 13 years. Um, you know, it, it's always helpful to kind of connect with your students and kind of draw on their own life or, you know, relate to them mm -hmm. uh, in a way that they'll understand. So that's kind of where that quote comes from. Just by a, a three or four or five year old child watching their parents on a daily basis, interacting with them, seeing how they treat each other, how they treat you know the child. Uh, when they begin to read the Bible or hear the Bible stories, they can see that it's true because, oh, my mom and dad do that, or that's what my mom and dad told me, or they tell me to do this. It, it relates, it connects. Yes. Uh, and secondly, Jesus spoke in parables in ways that people could understand, you know, mm -hmm. common language. So, you know, he would tell a parable and then, you know, when they hear it in the word of God, it, it rings true. It's easier mm -hmm. to understand. So that's just a biblical, a biblical truth, um, you know, that, we, we can we can relate the word of God uh, in a simple way, as simple as just how we treat each other. You know, when we read it in the word, it rings true and it reinforces the truth of God's word. Absolutely. Well, and I love that you liken it into to a war, a intentional, systematic, devastating war being waged on parents and traditional family values. And so each one of these parents is like and we grew up knowing this soldier in the Lord's army defending the word of God, defending their own family from falsehood, from heresy, from falling prey into the traps that are put in front of us. And we just all have such a better opportunity to be um, strong in the battle if we have the word. And so I'm thankful that the families of Master Books are working so hard to make sure children know the word. Yeah. Another quote that you um, shared 
as parents, particularly Christian parents who are married, are the first model of the gospel that children will learn even before learning to read, write, or tie their own shoes. Talk to us about that a little bit. <laughs> right. So, I mean, the word of God can be complicated at times. Um, but so just in how a, a mother and father, you know, how a husband and wife, I should say, a husband and wife have their relationship. You know, mm -hmm. that's a model of Christ and the church. Right. So when a child sees their mother and father their whole life and then they begin to read the doctrines of the Bible and, you know, how Christ and the bride and this and that, it makes better sense because they can see it in their parents. Yes. And then how God relates to us as children, uh, you know, that will they can be reminded of that and how their mother, father relate to them and mm -hmm. how there is at times there is chastisement or, you know, discipline or, you know, direction. And then there is grace, there is forgiveness, things like that that are modeled mm -hmm. in the home. It's only reinforced in the word of God, assuming that the parents, of course, you know, are following God's word. Mm -hmm. um, it, all of, a lot of these quotes really are very similar because it's all about in my mind, I had like a, a three or four or five year old child in mind, like a kindergartner, right. yeah. just starting out in education, just starting to read and write. They can already have an understanding of the word of God. You know mm -hmm. how God is like our heavenly father because he's like my father on earth. I have a father on earth. I have a father in heaven, yeah. right? My father loves me. God loves me, right? It's it's all uh, by design. You know, mm -hmm. God designed it that way and he wrote it that way in his words. So um, when we're able to teach these things at home to children directly from parent to child, that's the same as reading the word of God. You know, the Holy Spirit can reveal things to you in the word. A parent can teach things to a child at home. Uh, so in that way, homeschooling, particularly with a biblical worldview, is following the model of the Bible. Mm, I love that. So another one that I really enjoyed was um, being godly parents actually models the characteristics of God for your children. Like what you're saying, by having parents that love them, children are prepared to understand that God loves them, too. And that is definitely not going to be taught in a public school. You may have a teacher who is loving towards your child. And of course, I'm sure you were loving toward your students and loved them as their teacher wanted good for them. But it's almost um, governed out of what is happening in a public school today. Yeah. And this is forgiveness. We learn of God's grace, right? We can't be saved without God's grace and forgiveness. Mm -hmm. um, but it, the first thing that comes to mind in the public school is something I experienced personally in my own teacher training. Uh, was the doctrine of intersectionality or it, intersecting identities where people are divided. You're divided into two groups. You're the privileged or you're the marginalized. It's like oppressor versus oppressed. Where's the love and forgiveness in this? Where is the grace, right? It's not taught. It's not being taught through these doctrines that are in the public schools. I saw them. I had to complete the training, right? You're mm -hmm. divided. You know, you're yeah. divided and you're pit against each other. You know, Christians are looked at as oppressive. They're mm -hmm. labeled as oppressive. So are uh, straight men. You're oppressive. Mm -hmm. You know, so all it does is takes classmates and turns them into enemies. It mm -hmm. takes colleagues, turns them into enemies. There is no uniting like there is in the word of God. Mm -hmm. In the word of God, it doesn't matter who you are, where you're from, what color you are, what language you speak. If you're in Christ, we're one. Right. It's a yeah. it's a unifier. So it, yes. there's a, a they're totally opposite, you know, on on what they teach and what they preach. There's the word mm -hmm. of God. And then there's what we're seeing in the public school system. So um, there could be no clear distinction in my mind. I agree. And and I'm so I hate it. I hate that this is our reality, but I'm thankful that the Lord placed you in that school system so that you could shine a light on it, because I believe we're living in such times, desperate times that we have to have the light. We have to walk in the light, as the word says, and you are bringing the light of the fact that this is not the gospel. This is so far from the gospel and it is dangerous. So tell us a little bit about what you saw as far as the way the school uh, system was governed was truly like a disruption of the nuclear family similar to back in the time of Karl Marx and how that relates to what you witnessed as a teacher um, with the Black Lives Matter movement. Right. So 
Karl Marx, the father of Marxism, um, he said his goal in life was to dethrone God mm. and uh, destroy capitalism, right? That's what he's all about. And Marxism is basically about disrupting systems, whether that's, you know, an economic system, a religious system, or even the family unit. And the founders of Black Lives Matter are self-proclaimed Marxist. They say we're trained Marxists, okay? Um, and that's evident in, it was evident in their, you know, their mission statement about their page when they said, our goal is to disrupt the Western prescribed nuclear family. Who would want to disrupt the nuclear family? Mother, father, child, given all the statistics of, you know, fatherless homes and, or, you know, split homes, who, who would want to reinforce that? Um, and then so even further than that, we see, you know, how families are divided and undermined in school policies all over the country. And they're becoming more and more popular. Yes. And for example, what I'm talking about are things like parental secrecy policies. Okay. Where, so it, schools can have parental secrecy policies. They might be labeled something different. Mm -hmm. It might fall under the umbrella of the diversity, equity, inclusion policy or anti-bullying policy or even the health and wellness policy. So mm -hmm. what these policies do is say a child of any age, K through 12, uh, is you know exploring their identity and they say, a boy says, maybe I am a girl, or a girl says, maybe I am a boy. Then the school under their policy will keep that a secret from their parents. If the student says, I don't want my parents to know about this, the school will honor that because that's their policy. That's the school following the rules, all right? so. Where are the parents in this? Yeah. You could say that undermines the parents' authority, couldn't you? So this, and this is common across the country. This is happening all over the place. Right, now, not just in the school that you read. Right, right. So that right there is alarming. It's wrong. It's destructive. It's alarming. And I'll give one more example. Mao of communist China, he was a, Mar a Marxist and he hated the family. He even went so far as to uh, remove kitchens from homes to try to disrupt the family gathering where mm -hmm. families would eat in cafeterias. Parents were made to work and children were, were raised in daycares. So he was very anti-family. So that's the same kind of sentiment that we have mm -hmm. in our in our system today. You know, back in 2021, where um, we started to see more parents in school board meetings bringing up these issues. And then the uh, the National School Board Association wrote their letter to President Biden saying, we need help from the FBI, Homeland Security. These parents are domestic terrorists, right? And then our attorney general, Merrick Garland, wrote a letter in support of that. So parents were being labeled as terrorist enemies yeah. for standing up for their children. So how would you describe that? I would describe that as a war, you know, yeah. if, at least a spiritual war. So, yeah. Um, yeah. We have a book by Dr. Henry Morris called The Long War Against God. And this is... Part of it, what you what you've experienced and what you're shining the light on is part of the long war against God. And we as Christians cannot just stand by and let it just succumb to it, I guess. You know, we serve a God who makes a way, who breaks through the wall and or crush brings the wall down or removes the mountain and lifts up the valley. So we have the power of his word. We have the power of his light to bring the truth to bear and let people at least choose. I mean, that's who God is. He gives us a choice to serve him or not. But what you're doing with your book is helping parents see so they have a choice instead of just being ignorant to what is going on behind the scenes and is, oh, it's so insidious, right? That they are hiding. I mean, it is, um, there's a there's a verse and I can't think of where it is about masquerading as angels of light, but the devil will come and masquerade as an angel of light. So it looks like it's enlightenment, but it's darkness. Sure. Right. And right. So all the things I just talked about are upsetting. You probably mm -hmm. you can tell in me I'm I get worked up about this stuff. Sure. But it's I think it's really important that we don't stop. We don't just dwell on that, that we we always need to look to the word of God for the solution, for the answer. Yeah. We as Christians have hope, right? We should be hopeful people. We should be walking around with our heads down all the time. We should have right. hope. And that's what people should see. So a couple, you know, words of encouragement from the Bible. My favorite is Deuteronomy 6, 5 through 7. This mm -hmm. is what the Bible instructs parents to do. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, 
with all your soul and all your strength. And these words, which I command you today, shall be in your heart. Here we go. You shall teach them diligently to your children and talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down and when you rise up. And furthermore, it says, children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother. So these are the things that we should be teaching children, the ways yeah. of the Lord, the commandments of the Lord mm -hmm. throughout our day, waking up, going to bed, in the house, out of the house. And this is the instruction that God tells parents to give to their children. And that's that should be encouraging. What would your day look like if you spent your time talking with your children of the word of God and God's ways and all the wonderful things he's done for you? And all the wonderful things that he's done for your family. You know, this will build children up. This will strengthen families. And this mm -hmm. is the alternative to the public school system that we can choose. You know, and that should be an encouragement. I want to be a part of that. My wife and I, we're expecting our first child uh, any day now. And I yeah. can't wait to homeschool our child. I love it. Teach them the word of God and walk with them throughout the day. And every situation we come upon, we can point to the word of God and say, what does the Bible say about the situation? It's such you know, blessing. It'll be a blessing to me and certainly that child. So I look forward to that. And I encourage families, you know, to explore that as well. Yes. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Just yes. So, John, one of the things that you saw in the public school system was um, the early sexualization of young children as young as kindergarten. And by that, I mean, teaching them things that definitely are not biblical, but exposing them to information so early and yeah. in my mind as a form of brainwashing. But I'd like for you to share a little bit about what you experienced with um, teaching children as young as kindergarten. Right. Well, in my mind, I, I would take it even further than brainwashing. It's a form of kidnapping and I'll explain how. Oh. So just based on what I saw in, in my year with Chicago Public Schools, in my teacher training, we were given resources, you know, documents, pamphlets that we could print out and put in our classroom. And one was the gender unicorn. And this isn't specific to Chicago. You can find this across the country. Mm -hmm. So it's it's a graphic. It looks like Barney. And it's intended specifically for kindergartners. Uh, they describe it as a cute character. Your, your children will love this. Your students will love it. Put this in your classroom and talk about it. So what the gender unicorn teaches is that students can be um, they can be male, female, or any other gender, other genders. They can be attracted to males, females, or other genders. So here already at five years old, we have this concept that, you know, gender is, it's not just male and female, like the Bible says, there are other genders, you know, and it's this cute little Barney character telling you this. It's like kids want to play with this Barney character. They want to be like Barney. They want to live in this Barney world. Um, so, you know, they're they're getting the five year old, the five year old students from the jump. And that reminds me, Lenin in the USSR, uh, he said that kindergarten classes were the sprouts of communism. So there's an understanding that getting to children early mm -hmm. is important when you're trying to indoctrinate them. Getting right. to them early has been done before. This is not mm -hmm. the first time this has happened in world history. And so beyond that, later on in my teaching or my teaching training, later on in my teacher's training, mm -hmm. we were given an example of an actual student in our district, an eighth grader who identified as trans in school, mm -hmm. but had not told their parents. And teachers were instructed to keep that from parents. This was the policy. This is what we were supposed to do. Mm -hmm. OK, keep that information from parents. If they ask me about it, I'm supposed to deflect and not give them a straight answer. This is lying. Not only is it lying to the child. You know, reinforcing yeah. their confusion and I, you know, the, we can have compassion on a confused child, of course. Sure. But we sh we shouldn't reinforce the lie or reinforce the confusion. That's not compassionate. That's not loving. Mm -hmm. And then secondly, lie to the parents. These were the things that I wasn't going to do. Um, right. So this is how, you know, one, they're brainwashed, but two, they're kidnapped because they're keeping things from the parents. Mm -hmm. It's a form of kidnapping. Their soul. So it's, yeah, they're, their soul. Yeah, their mind happy. and their soul. Mm -hmm. The school is taking these things, you know, or the individuals within the school mm -hmm. and the parents are kept away. You know, it can be related to kidnapping in my mind. Yes. So uh, that's serious. And then that child comes home and the parents don't know what's happening at school a lot of the times. Mm 
-hmm. And that goes on for how long? You know, it only gets reinforced and reinforced. And go back to what I talked about with the intersectionality, uh, intersecting identities, adults and parents are seen as oppressive. So we have the school telling them that your parents are the bad guys. They're dangerous. We're the safe ones. This is the safe space. We mm -hmm. care about you. We love you. Your parents are dangerous. This is the dynamic that's reinforced in a lot of school systems around the country. Um, you know, and that's dangerous. Yeah. You know, to say the least. Teaching them not to think for themselves, but to actually be, you know, to because they're so young, they are going to listen to whoever's teaching them. So right. And so that goes back to, you know, learning the gospel from your parents as a child before you can even tie your shoes. So if mm -hmm. you're young and you know you grew up with Christian parents and they're modeling the gospel, but then you go to a public school and they're saying that your parents are dangerous, you sh shouldn't always listen to your parents. Right. We have confusion here. We mm -hmm. have a divide, right? Mm -hmm. there, it doesn't go together, right? right? So a decision has to be made there. But if you're not even raised in a Christian home and your parents don't model that gospel for you, and then you go to the public school system, what you know? What chance do you stand? Tell us. Tell us a little bit about what happened in our history. You brought up Karl Marx. You brought up different things in our history that this looks like. Like it's happening again. It's right in front of our eyes. What was the result? And what do we need to be fighting against? Yeah, there's a chapter in my book where I talk about, you know, the, the 20th century and the rise of communism. Mm -hmm. And I just draw certain parallels between our education system here in America and other education systems around the world that were used to implement you know, Marxism and communism and socialist ideals. And there are many parallels with those systems and our own. Mm -hmm. uh, I mentioned one of them with Lenin uh, himself describing kindergarten classes as the sprouts of communism. You know, they all had, they all had certain things in common. They, they removed the Bible, you know, from education. Um, they undermine parents or the family unit as a whole. Mm -hmm. They politicized education. They brought in politics, moved academics aside and brought in their own ideologies. Mm -hmm. We can see certain parallels to what's happening right now. And that should alarm us because what was the result back then? What was the result of the rise of communism? You know, it culminated with, you know, in Nazi Germany, we had the Holocaust. We had led to World War II. And then beyond that, we have uh, Mao's communist China and then Pol Pot in Cambodia. So wherever these ideas are implemented and the, you know, the, uh, the flames are fanned and they are allowed to grow, it doesn't end well. So we should want nothing to do with these ideologies or these practices in any way whatsoever. So whenever I see any sort of similarity, like the undermining of families or the removal of the Bible, I'm alarmed because we should always learn from history and we could see where we've stopped along the way and learn from it. How did it work out then? And what can we do differently? So that's, in my mind, that's my favorite chapter of the book, just because the parallels to me are so alarming and we should learn from history, but we're not doing that. The revision of history, revisionism, changing mm -hmm. our country's history. We saw that a little bit in recent years, the tearing down of statues and this and that. So, and the, the demonizing of people, um, you know, we change the history of a country. Well, one of your chapters is on the benefits of homeschooling. So I want to talk about that for just a moment. I, I really encourage everyone to read this book, pour over it, share it with other people, because this is a form of bringing the light to the darkness. And I am a living testimony of that. God will do that for you and your family. When you ask for the light, he will bring it because he is the truth. So I want to talk a little bit about the challenges people have in making the decision to homeschooling, you've learned something recently um, that will help them. So tell us a little bit about that. Sure. Actually, Israel Wayne is the one who kind of uh, pointed me in this direction. Mm -hmm. Israel Wayne pointed out some resources through the Christian Education Initiative, this organization. Uh, he initially pointed out their article, Shekels with Shackles, which talks about school choice and funding. Mm -hmm. But uh, the organization also provides something called the Christian Education scholarship program. This is something that can be run through the local church and it can help parents financially who need financial help providing a Christian education for their children, whether that be through homeschooling or through a local Christian school. Uh, so how it works is it's basically 
um, set up through the church, an individual within the church approaches church leadership and says, hey, we're interested in starting a Christian education scholarship program. Uh, the church puts together a board who oversees this. Uh, they write out the rules, you know, and how it works. People can apply. Uh, funds are issued out. Um, it's tax deductible. But how it works is it's basically like taking tithes. You know, if the okay. church the church uh, discusses this, you know, to the congregation and says, we value the upbringing of our children. You know, we're commanded in the word of God to train them up in the way they should go. Mm -hmm. And we prioritize the education of our children. We want to do this here in the local church. So people can give to that work just like they would give their tithing. Uh, and then so that's how the, you know, the money is collected. And again, this is for families in need, families who need the financial help. You know, that's that's one of the common things I hear on why I can't homeschool. It's mm -hmm. yeah, it's either I want my children to be socialized, you know, to have you know, yeah. to develop socially. So I want to send them to public schools. The second one is financially. You know, we can't take off work. I, I can't lose hours at work. We don't have the money. So this is one way that the local church can help families in need is through these Christian education scholarship programs. And it's simple to set up. It's simple to run. You just need a handful of individuals willing to oversee it. And um, I think Jennifer is going to share it with everyone, but you can find this uh, online. All this information is free. It's free to download, print, use it as you want. Uh, it's found at ChristEDU.org. And if you just look at the resource tab, you'll find it at the bottom of the page. Yeah, so I will add that to the show notes so that you can easily find the information. But John, I also want to put in the show notes and want you to talk a few moments just about your podcast and um, your work, the things that you do besides writing this book to help people. I want people to, um, because we want you to share this message. We want you to share the real reality going on in public school system and your choices sharing with the wisdom that you have with other people who have not yet made the choice to homeschool. Um, I want y'all to hear John's podcast. He has, he's taking a lot of time to research what's going on and share it. And so John, tell us a little bit about that. Sure. Uh, well, we're talking about my book today and thank you again for that. But before the book um, even came to be, I was making online courses through master books, mm -hmm. uh, PE focused. I was a PE teacher for a number of years. So that's one thing that uh, I do is I make those online PE courses and then my book. And then the podcast uh, is really just another way to provide information. Like I talked about earlier, provide information to families, mm -hmm. teachers, administrators, anyone who cares about education uh, on a weekly basis. So my podcast is called the state of state schools, as in the condition of state schools. Right. And I just, I, I look at the highlights from the week, the education highlights, the big stories and topics. And I discuss them from a biblical perspective as a Christian, mm -hmm. as a former teacher, as a former homeschooler. Mm -hmm. um, so if, if you're a parent, teacher, anyone interested, and you just kind of want to know, you know, what's going on out there and you don't have a lot of time to read it, read about it. My podcasts are about 15 minutes once a week. You know, you can listen while you're in the house, while you're driving, just living your life. And it's just a way to stay on top of what could be coming down the pipeline in your hometown or your school district. Right. Yeah, we want you to be aware. Yeah. And and really with this book, John is sounding the alarm for families. And we know that you are a, a Christian homeschool family who already knows some of the dangers. You've already made this choice and you are a light to a lot of people in your sphere of influence. And so we invite you to join us and sharing the information, the light through this book, as well as um, the resources that John had talked about today. So thank you, John, for being a part of the Masterbooks family, being a part of this podcast today and caring so much about um, our this generation and the one to come. Well, thank you so much for having me, Jennifer. You know, if I could just say one thing before we leave, I know that the topics we talk about, we talked about today and in my book are very heavy. They're serious, they're important, and we should talk about them and address them. But it's really, really important as believers, especially, that we have hope, that we have yeah. courage, that we're encouraged in the Lord, that we're not fearful of these things, mm -hmm. um, that we it only causes us to cling tighter to the Lord. And ultimately, I hope that's what people take away. You know, when I was writing this book and I was researching these topics, it was heavy. It was not always enjoyable and fun. I had to get away from it at times because it weighs you down. 
And that's yeah. not a good place to stay. So I just want to encourage everyone, um, you know, to focus on the Lord and what he has provided to lift us out of these things. Right. right. So we should have hope and we should be encouraged. And I hope that's what you guys take away from uh, you know, my book and our conversation today. Yes. And the power of God's word to overcome. He makes us more than conquerors. And he is the word made flesh. Jesus is the word made flesh. The word is not going to fail. It's always going to return yeah. what it's meant to do. And mm-hmm. so wherever you are, start now and don't let the past of what you've allowed to come into your home or into your child's life through public schooling or any other thing. We have to be on guard and be vigilant, but trusting that God cares far more for you and your children than you are able to. And he will lead you. He will give you the will give you the courage, the boldness to take a stand. So I do pray that for all of you. I pray for that wisdom, that liberal wisdom that he gives you for the conviction, that compelling um, conviction to do what the Lord is leading you and your family to do and the opportunity to shine the light of the truth um, so that the Lord will be using you to bring the fullness of his light on the darkness. And we know that is he is able to do so exceedingly and abundantly. So God bless you all. God bless you, John Stamper, and your family and your soon-to-be little darling child that's coming into this world. And we will see you all back on the Master Books podcast soon. Take care. Hey, thanks for joining us today for the Master Books podcast. It was really fun to do this with you today. We hope that you'll take a moment and rank and review the podcast wherever you are listening or watching so that others can find it more easily. We loved having you here and we look forward to being with you on the next podcast. It comes out every other week, Mondays at 5 a.m. See you then.